volumes, masses, and centers of mass. Be able to draw and describe the informal reasoning that dv is a of x dx. How do you describe that? You say, well, we're slicing it so that we get these infinitely thin, infinitesimally thin wafers, so to speak. Use the word infinitesimal. With dx, where dx is an infinitesimally tiny number. And then, if you look at that thin wafer head on, that's called a cross section. What's the area of that? Call it a of x, because it changes as x changes. And this quote unquote product then gives you the little tiny volume of a little thin wafer that you've sliced. And then informally, this equation says the total volume is the sum of little volumes. This is not rigorous math. Ultimately, though, it gets you to what you do, and you integrate the a of x function from a to b, where x ranges from a to b to get the answer. This comes up in two main situations. Volumes of solids of revolution, so take a region in the xy plane and revolve it around some axis. Your cross sections then are either disks, circles, or rings. Washers, annuli, different words for those. Or volumes of solids with specified cross sections like squares or equilateral triangles. Or what we didn't have time for in class, even semicircles. Should be able to handle a semicircle case too. The formula for the area of a semicircle is pi r squared over 2. Instead of pi r squared. Um, masses of thin rods, <coughs> linear mass density, delta of x, and you say grams per centimeter. There's informal reasoning there as well. And if the length of the rod is L, and I've chosen the coordinates so that it goes from 0 to L there, that's the integral you do. Once you get the mass, if you do this integral and, and divide by the mass, that's the center of mass, which is the balance point. Next Wednesday, we'll go try to explain that a little more. There's the thin disk problems, masses of thin disks. Ultimately, you end up doing integrals like this, but again, you should be able to informally explain the derivation. We're not really worried about the Riemann sum approach here, though I think after the exam, we'll, we'll do some summation forms of these things, of these derivations. More informal justifications there. Draw pictures to help you justify as well, like the pictures that I drew. This is going quick, lots to do. And then one more main application. This is the last one, and that's probability. This is what we probably spent the most time on. That's the end here. Um, You've got a continuous random variable, call it capital T. Could be a wait time. Could be a time of a lifetime of a person or an object. You'd like to find probabilities, chances of certain events. Like how likely is it this baby will die between the ages of 70 and 80? That kind of chance is important in applications, for example, for insurance companies, to know what they should charge you for life insurance, for example. Uh, there's two main kinds of functions to deal with. Probability density functions, PDFs, and cumulative distribution functions, CDFs. Are the two main functions to deal with. You integrate the PDF to find the probability. This, just, this notation just says find the probability that t is between a and b. You do subtractions of values of the CDF to find probabilities because the CDF, the capital F, is an antiderivative of little f. So derivatives and integrals are very, very relevant here. The second fundamental theorem of calculus is relevant by the fact that the derivative of an integral like this is the little f. Realize that a could be minus infinity, b could be infinity. Um, Though for lifetime random variables, the a is zero. We don't consider negative times for those. That's why it's called a lifetime random variable. It's the life of something. Here's an approximation I did not write yet. Again, when this delta t is small here, this gives you intuition for 
you know, when the density is higher in one spot than another, essentially when you've got a small interval of time here, like maybe 30 years to 30.1 years, you know, what's the chance that somebody's going to die between the ages of 30 and 30.1? 30, you know, 36 days after the 30th birthday kind of thing. Um, you actually, to get a good approximation, you don't have to do an interval. You can just take the function value of the PDF times the time interval to get your approximation because over such a small time interval, the PDF is going to be almost constant. If it's steep, it's, it's short if delta t is small. And so you can approximate the area under the PDF as an area of a rectangle, essentially. It's like a left-hand sum with one rectangle. So the height of the PDF over small time intervals is proportional to the chance that you're going to die during that small time interval. So if the PDF is twice as high when you're 80 years old as when you're 40 years old, over a small time interval, like a tenth of a year, your chance of dying from 80 to 80.1 is twice as high as dying from 30 to 30.1. The PDF is twice as high. So I haven't mentioned that yet, but I thought it was worth mentioning now. Almost done. Be able to calculate means and medians. Also be able to, be able to interpret the graphs in terms of areas of the PDF and differences of the CDF. Um, calculate the mean by doing this kind of integral. T times the PDF. Calculate the median by solving this kind of equation for this upper limit. T med is the median time. Do the integral with T med as an unknown. Set it equal to 0.5 and solve for T med. It would be to how to find the median time. Both the mean and median are measures of central tendency. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. It's no wonder it took me the whole time anyway here. Um, let me know if you've got questions. I, I will work on putting some of the answers to those problems up on Moodle as much as I can. I don't know that I'll have time for all of them. But you can certainly work together and compare answers as well. Okay.